Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name's uh, Dave Rajeski, and I direct the um, Program on Science and Technology Innovation here. And over the past year or so, we've been having a series of talks on how do we deal or do not deal with complex systems. Um, and so uh, when I got a call <coughs> from Greg um, to talk about his new book, it was something that was extremely interesting to us. And uh, I'm going to just um, say a few words. Greg is uh, chief economics commentator uh, for the Wall Street Journal. The book is foolproof. Um, we've got copies out there if you want to buy them um, and when we're done. And the subtitle is Why Safety Can Be Dangerous and How Danger Makes Us Safe, which is an intriguing subtitle. Um, uh, so also, Greg actually completed or spent part of your time here. Yeah, two months. Two months of your time uh, actually writing the book. And it's always great to have people back because we watch you kind of in the center struggling and, and trying to write and get references and then hopefully something valuable pops out. It's great to have you come back and share, share what you've done with us. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is just have Greg go through the book uh, a little bit in terms of the primary ideas, theses, conclusions, uh, recommendations. So everybody has a uh, sort of a base to, to talk uh, a little bit uh, after after this afterwards about the book. I think we'll, when we're done, we'll, we'll actually make the slides available to people as well as this um, as this presentation. Um, and so, why don't you start, and sure. uh, we'll um, take a look at the slides and then have a discussion. All right, I'm, I'm going to do it from up there where I'm a little bit more uh, comfortable. Uh, thanks very much, David. And thank you. I, first of all, I want to express my gratitude to the Wilson Center for having been uh, my home for a couple months. Um, it was actually terrific. I was probably early into my research then, but the time I spent here was the most productive I spent in the two years writing the book, partly because I was surrounded by interesting people, but I, you know, I had a nice little quiet office on actually this floor. And the, um, this ma the amazing library here where you actually could act borrow any book you wanted from the Library of Congress. I know we live in this digital era, but there's nothing really quite like having the physical book from 100 years ago in your fingers. And um, it's, the Library of Congress is an amazing um, public good for somebody like me who was exploring so many different disciplines. It was just um, an unparalleled, unequaled resource. Uh, so thank you very much for having me uh, then, and thank you for having me back. And so I'm delighted to talk to you about the product of all the research that I spend here. Uh, my book's called Foolproof, and um, it began with my own sort of exploration of how we had a fi global financial crisis and a little bit of a sense of guilt because I myself had been covering economics and finance for 20 years, and I was completely caught uh, unawares by the crisis. And I thought that we had actually solved most of the problems that would lead to that sort of an event. And I guess uh, upon reflection, I realized that was exactly the problem, that I and indeed many of the people that I would write about or interview had convinced themselves that we had solved all the problems and that allowed risks to grow. So that's how the book began. And, I've and I since mm -hmm. have de found similar phenomena across all aspects of the environment and technology. And I think it has interesting implications for us about how we think as a society about the notion of safety and the, merit, the pluses and minuses of taking risk. So the, to give you the thesis at the beginning, um, stability and a sense of safety encourage us to take more risk. Now, it may not be the case that the additional risk that we take makes us bet worse off, but there is a trade-off there. Eliminating one type of risk often causes a different sort of risk to reemerge somewhere else that we're actually not watching for, and that can cause a problem later on. And individuals, when they try to take care of themselves with some sort of a device or innovation or practice, they may have unintended consequences that actually put everybody else and the rest of society at risk. So these are all ways <coughs> that our pursuit of safety and stability can have un unintended consequences that actually achieve the opposite. My story begins a century ago in what we call the progressive era when wh there, were, uh, there was a combination of forces that came about that persuaded um, uh, Americans that they could actually take more control over the economy and the environment and, and make ourselves better off. One of them was that there was a, a growing backlash against uh, capitalism's excesses in the Gilded Age. And there was also advances in scientific and social science knowledge that sort of uh, convinced us that we had the tools to uh, manage the economy and the environment. Um, uh, Alfred Marshall wrote Principles of Economics in the late 1800s, and that was the first book to actually take a scientific approach to the study 
of economics, things like the American Planning Association, the American Society of Foresters, the American Economic Association, mm -hmm. were all created around that time. Woodrow Wilson, uh, the first president, and so far only president, to have had a PhD and a big believer in the scientific management of government. In 1907, there was a huge financial panic and it persuaded uh, leaders in this country that we didn't have to put up with these periodic panics any longer. That if we created a central bank to act as lender of, resor lender of last resort to private banks, that we could uh, prevent financial crises uh, thereafter. And Robert Owen, a senator, said in 1908, it is a duty of the United States to provide a means by which the periodic panics which shake the American Republic and do it enormous injury shall be stopped. Owen is an interesting character because he himself had actually been a small uh, uh, community banker in Oklahoma for a number of times. He had actually seen his father uh, economically wiped out in the Panic of 1873, and Owen's own little bank in Oklahoma was almost destroyed by the Panic of 1891. So he's speaking from personal experience. So this created a groundswell of support within Congress, and although there were deep div uh, divisions about um, how the central bank should be set up, whether bankers should be in charge or political appointees should be in charge, it ended up with uh, Woodrow Wilson signing the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. Um, this wasn't the only thing in the progressive era that pushed us towards a greater uh, desire for control over our surroundings. In 1910, there were um, the worst fires in the history of the, uh, of the nation at the time. Now, up until 1910, um, most Americans and settlers accepted fire as kind of just the uh, natural consequence of living on the uh, frontier. And in fact, they would routinely use fire to clear land for agriculture, just as the uh, Indians had done many years before the Europeans came. But this fire completely changed attitudes. It destroyed an unprecedented amount of, of the Western United, of, of forest land. And it created a conviction, not just a, both among industry, which wanted those trees for lumber and paper, and Theodore Roosevelt, who wanted those trees for uh, f uh, forests, that they had to control fire. And Gifford Pinchot, who was a uh, confidant of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the first director of the U.S. Forest Service, declared that forest fires are wholly within the control of men, and the first duty of the human race is to control the earth it lives upon. And so the U.S. Forest Service, which at the time was only five years old, made its mission at that time suppressing all fires. And in the, by the 1930s, they had a, pl a policy called the 10 a.m. policy that uh, once a fire was detected, it had to be under control by 10 a.m. the next day. This is an early poster from the 1920s, and it symbolizes the kind of attitude the Federal Reserve was trying to convey to the public, that it was this mighty bulwark of funds that would save the U.S. economy from... Uh, the perils of financial threats. And, you can f and there are similar posters out there from the Forest Service of Smokey Bear, for example, uh, declaring that it was a duty of Americans not to allow the terrible waste of forests, uh, for of wildfire to cripple the American economy. These were, recru th these were actually uh, posters used during World War II to, uh, as well, rally s uh, civil, um, civil support for the war effort. Was it successful? Well, if you ask from a narrow point of view, it was successful in the sense the Fed did successfully prevent many uh, financial panics. And it was successful in the sense that the Forest Service did suppress many wildfires. But in the long run, it had unintended consequences. We now, um, uh, we still have financial crises like the 2007 mm -hmm. and 2009 mm -hmm. financial crisis. And we still have wildfires. In fact, wildfires in the last decade or two have been the biggest we've seen in, uh, in many, many decades. And this, is an, um, and this, I would say, is not because of uh, one of the, um, a central theme in my book is that when we look at these disasters, to think of them not as a product of failure, but as a product of success. So the financial crisis was a product of the Fed's success at ironing out the business cycle, just as the fires we're experiencing now are, besides a uh, warming climate, a consequence of the Forest uh, Service's success at suppressing fires. I, in my book, one of the themes that I pursue is uh, where do these philosophical approaches to the control of our environment come from? And I attribute what began in the progressive era to what I call the school of engineering, which is basically we have this knowledge, let's use it to eliminate instability and disaster from our lives. But then I will argue there's a competing school of people that I call ecologists, and you can find uh, elements of this in economics and in science and in biology, who believe that people in the environment always adapt. And if you can try too hard to control your environment and the economy and to eliminate uh, threats, you will uh, cause unintended consequences that may be worse than the problem. Now, 
I, in writing this book, I became fascinated by the d different um, belief systems that both of these uh, types of individuals have. And I found I, s I could not personally um, align myself completely with one or the other. I like to say that I started my professional life as a uh, ecologist because I was very suspicious of the Federal Reserve intervening to save us from financial crises. By 2007, I'd become an engineer because I was so impressed by that point of the job the Fed had been doing, eliminating recessions. Then the crisis came along, and now I've <laughs> ended up somewhere in between the two. But I think that made me well equipped to evaluate the pluses and minuses of both approaches. Thinking about the economy for a moment, for 25 years, if you look at the gray lines, was the recessions. And so the period we had from here, we had a lot of recessions, and there wasn't a lot of um, accumulation of debt. But starting in 1982, we had a period that economists later called the Great Moderation, where the Fed basically brought inflation under control and made recessions much milder and less frequent. So you'll see here we have a recession in 1991 and a recession in 2000, and those were the two mildest recessions of the post-war period. And that essentially encouraged people to take on more debt and to believe that ho house prices and other asset prices would never go down, because after all, you weren't going to have a severe crisis in the economy. But that actually created the conditions for, what, for the crisis and recession and uh, the, the worst recession of the post-war period. Uh, the same thing happened in our regulatory approach to uh, finance. So although we've almost forgotten it, in the early 1980s, a lot of our largest banks were on the brink of collapse because they had lent too much money to Latin America and Latin America couldn't pay it back. So Paul Volcker and then Alan Greenspan set out to actually make the banks safer by requiring the hold more equity capital. And that meant that if they lost money because of a bad loan decision, the money would not cause them to default on uh, their debts or be unable to repay depositors. It would come out of the shareholders' capital and the bank would survive. And so over this period, right up until the crisis, you actually see bank equity capital rising. But this had an unintended consequence. <coughs> when banks are forced to hold more equity, they have to share the profits among shareholder, more shareholders, so they're less profitable. And that meant lending opportunities migrated away from banks to others, which w what we call now, now call shadow banks, companies like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, off-balance sheet uh, uh, investment funds, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So as a consequence, you see here, this is a share of total lending by banks. And so as they became safer, they became less important. And by the, uh, by the time of the financial crisis, you had all this lending and leverage that was built up outside the banks where we really weren't aware of it or aware how big and potentially dangerous it was. A similar phenomenon um, can be observed in natural disasters. It <coughs> seems that for the last <coughs> decade, we've had one after another record-breaking uh, disaster, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, um, the, uh, uh, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, just this year, Hurricane uh, Joaquin. Um, this tells you that we're seeing uh, ever more billion-dollar disasters. And if I were to actually put the total price of these disasters up there, you'd see, see large spikes as we entered the 2000s. Now, there are uh, there's a lot of concern that this is a consequence of global warming, especially in terms of flooding and, uh, and hurricanes. And there is scientific consensus that um, a warming climate can contribute to severe weather events. But that is not the primary reason why the cost of disasters is going up. The main reason disasters are becoming more costly is because we're putting more wealth on the coasts right where they're most vulnerable to Mother Nature. In fact, we do uh, they're vulnerable to disaster for the same reason that they're prosperous places to have cities. When you're close to water, that helps your transportation links. This has been true for hundreds of years. It's why cities like New York, Amsterdam, Jakarta, London, and Tokyo are so close to the water because it's good for, um, for uh, transport links. It turns out people just like to live next to water. It's, it's really temperate and pleasant. Um, the uh, floodplain is where the soil was richest, so that was good for agriculture. This poster or this chart shows you the buildup of uh, the value of structures in the 100-year <coughs> uh, floodplain of uh, New York City. As you can see, by merely based on economic development, it was guaranteed that a storm hitting now was going to be more costly than the last big storm, which in the case of New York was in 1938. It was called the uh, New England, Great New England Hurricane. This is a very interesting picture, and um, so let me walk you through it a little bit. N a lot of lower Manhattan is built on landfill. In fact, that is true of a lot of coastal cities, is that because these became such valuable places to work, a lot of land was rec reclaimed from the sea to expand the possibility of putting people in such productive places. So if you look at the uh, little red line here, it's a little bit faint, but that's the original outline of lower Manhattan. Everything else is landfill since 1609. Now look at the blue area. That's actually the areas that were flooded by Superstorm Sanity in 2012. And you can see how closely mm -hmm. they match each other. And all mm -hmm. that tells you is that New York City was basically um, – 
uh, it was inevitable that New York City was going to be flooded this way because it's in some sense been like courting disaster from the moment it was founded. And so uh, one of the lessons of this is that because New York City keeps getting wealthier and more prosperous, it's almost uh, inevitable that uh, another hurricane is going to come along and be potentially even more damaging than Sandy. Because remember, New York is placed in, uh, in a unique location where once or twice uh, every 50 years, a very large hurricane that may not necessarily be very intense but is very wide can hit that city in such a way that it does immense damage. Uh, talking a little bit about forest fires, this is an interesting chart. and It tells you how much actual forest fire we've had over the last 2,000 years. This is based on things like the amount of charcoal sediment that can be found on lake bottoms, uh, how thick the bark is on old trees that have been around for thousands of years. And what these scientists did was they basically made a record of how much fire we've had. And it's, it's gone up and down basically tracking how hot and dry the climate is because we have separate records of those things. But the last century is an anomaly where we saw the uh, hot climate get steadily hotter and drier and the amount of fire actually went down. And the reason why was because we were suppressing fires. And what this tells you is that it's almost like there's this amount of uh, fuel out there waiting to be burned that hasn't been burned off. And so when you see that this year is going to be one of the worst wildfire seasons in American history, again, part of the story is the warming climate. But the other part of the story is that we have not, we have artificially suppressed the natural amount of fire that would normally come along uh, in those kinds of conditions. And we know that fire actually has very valuable properties. It, it takes away some of the... Um, uh, dead tree matter on the, on the floor of the forest. It kills off the young weak trees and allows the stronger trees to survive. So by interfering with that process, we actually <coughs> created the conditions for worse fires later on, just as we did with our economy. In human technology, the, uh, the notion that making us, you know, uh, giving ourselves something that makes us safer may, might make us take more risks is very intuitive. And in 1975, an economist at the University of Chicago named Sam Peltzman claimed that he had, uh, did a study and, and purported to find that when people wore seatbelts, they drove faster. And while the number of driver deaths went down, the number of pedestrian deaths went up. This was very controversial, and it sparked decades of research and efforts to find it in different uh, um, walks of life. The upshot of all this research is that the best as we can tell, safety belts on net actually do save lives. We do not lose more lives to reckless driving as a consequence of people uh, wearing seat belts. But other research has found that this Peltzman effect is alive and well in other aspects. For example, with anti-lock brakes. There have been countless studies and they find that anti-lock brakes do not reduce the number of accidents. Why is that? It's not really clear, but uh, people appear to drive differently, at least in the, in, uh, in the early years of anti-lock brakes. There's a study of, uh, one study, for example, found that cars equipped with anti-lock brakes were involved in fewer front-end collisions, but they had more rear-end collisions. And this may be because drivers with anti-lock brakes were braking harder and causing people behind them to hit them. And it turns out that uh, this is actually a concern now with uh, Google cars because they're so sensitive about stopping at red lights that apparently they keep getting hit from behind. <laughs> the Peltzman effect appears in other walks of life. For example, in football, um, uh, hard helmets were introduced to football around the 1940s and 1950s. And it helped reduce things like broken teeth and broken noses. Uh, but um, it also encouraged coaches to teach their uh, players to use their head as a weapon to spear the opponent. And what uh, Scott, uh, in the next few decades, we saw a, a sharply rising incidence of spinal injuries like broken necks and um, quadriplegia because when a player spears another, they put all this pressure on the spinal column. That turned, a bit, that turned out to be very injurious. So both college and professional football have banned spearing in most circumstances, but they haven't been able to prevent players from continuing to use a helmeted head as a weapon. And that is a major reason why concussions remain such a problem in, uh, in football, is that um, helmets are so incredibly effective at, uh, at insulating the head from pain that the player can almost not help himself using that head as a weapon on another player. And the same is true of financial derivatives, by the way. The purpose of a derivative is enabled to a bank or a hedge fund or somebody else to shift their risk to somebody else. But in doing so, it encourages them to take on bigger risks. The Peltzman effect appears in other places. For example, um, a few years ago, a, uh, an Airbus, um, uh, an Air France Airbus was flying from Rio de Janeiro to Paris and it disappeared in a thunderstorm. And it took the French investigators years to locate the wreckage on the seafloor and bring it up and uh, locate the black boxes and find exactly why this airplane crashed. And one of the mysteries was is that as they listened to it, it was clear that this airplane, which is very sophisticated and is designed not to stall, if the, if the uh, pilot takes it in too, too steep a climb, a stall warning will go off and tell the, uh, sorry, if the pilot tries to put it into too steep a climb, 
the um, fly-by-wire technology of this airplane is supposed to prevent that from happening. However, what the pilot didn't seem to realize while he was flying this plane is that the um, airspeed indicators had frozen up because of the weather. And that when that happens, the um, fly-by-wire controls are de deactivated and the plane now can stall. As he took it up into a steep climb, stall warnings sounded in the cockpit. And when the investigators listened to the tape on the black box, they could hear that. They could hear the computers saying, stall, stall. And the pilot ignored it. He kept climbing steeply. Why is that? We don't know because he didn't survive. But we think it's because he was convinced that these airplanes weren't supposed to stall, so the warning must have been a false warning. Another source of unintended consequences of safety is what I call the fallacy of composition. And this is basically the, idea, the, um, the belief, the false belief that what's good for the individual is good for everybody. You go to a movie and you want to see better, so you stand up. That's good for you. But what if everybody stands up? Nobody sees better and you're all kind of uncomfortable. That's sort of the uh, textbook example of fallacy of composition. But it appears in many aspects of uh, uh, economic and technological and environmental uh, safety as well. I, I already gave you my example of anti-lock brakes, uh, which encourage harder braking. Uh, financial derivatives. Um, a, for example, um, many banks during in the run-up to the financial crisis wanted to uh, have more lending and to purchase more subprime mortgages. And to reduce the risk of that and to please their regulators, they bought insurance policies in the form of derivatives from companies like AIG, the big insurance company. Well, this did make the bank more safe, but they had simply shifted the risk to AIG. AIG thought that there was very little risk in these mortgages based on the history of housing prices and defaults. What they didn't realize was that by making it safer for banks to, to purchase and make these mortgage loans, banks did more of it. So there was more risk rising in the system because banks were <laughs> all believed that they individually had protected themselves from the risk, not realizing that collectively risk was rising in the system. When that system came undone and home prices fell, AIG found that it had written all these insurance policies that it could no longer honor because it, uh, an event was happening that it had not anticipated. In fact, the very fact that it was willing to sell that insurance almost guaranteed that the event that it had uh, insured against was going to happen. Another example is antibiotics. Antibiotics were discovered in the 1920s and, uh, and isolated in the 1930s and 1940s. They were a miracle drug. But we now know that widespread use of antibiotics generates resistance in ways that we didn't even anticipate at the time. It's not just Darwin's principle of natural selection, but it turns out that antibiotics are incredibly clever. They will actually in, um, ex uh, exchange bits of DNA and acquire resistance properties from each other. Within years of uh, things like penicillin, penicillin and um, um, uh, methicillin being introduced in the 50s and 60s, resistance strains were appearing in hospitals and then soon in the broader community. This is an interesting chart and it from my old um, uh, employer, The Economist, and it basically shows a very strong positive correlation between the use of antibiotics, which is along the right side, and the prevalence of resistance on the left side. And if you think about MRSA, uh, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus, this is practically a man, it kills uh, more than 10,000 people a year. Uh, it uh, results in more than 80,000 uh, infections. You might have heard there's a New York Giants player named Daniel Fells who uh, for a while was at risk of losing his foot to MRSA. And this is basically a man-made scourge that we have brought upon ourselves because of the excessive use of antibiotics, which is exactly a product of the fallacy of composition, the belief that by making myself safer, I've made everybody safe. So what should we do? <coughs> well, you can sort of throw up your hands and say, this is just a civilizational dilemma. You know, We can't stop ourselves from trying to be safer and more stable, uh, and we can't stop these catastrophes from coming along, so we should just deal with it. I was a little bit tempted to say that, but I concluded that was a pretty like, depressing way to finish a book. <laughs> so I thought very hard about the lessons that we had learned that actually can do some good. And the fact of the matter is, is despite my preoccupation with crisis and disaster, the world gets better all the time. You know, uh, we're living longer. We're more prosperous. We do have fewer people are dying from natural disasters and fewer people are dying in uh, car accidents. So we must be doing something right. What can we learn from all that? I'll play with a few things. First of all, the second part of my book's title is How Danger make Can Make Us Safe. And I love this story of aviation because um, as a journalist, uh, um, you love to write about plane crashes and the people who uh, operate the airlines would always complain that we would only write about the plane crashes and we would never write about the thousands of airplanes that land safely. And so this time I decided to find out why it is that so many airplanes land safely. And it is astonishing how safe it is to fly. <coughs> I mean, you have a kid in Massachusetts uh, is two and a half times more likely to win the megabucks jackpot lottery than to die by getting on his next flight. 
um, you're more likely to grow up to be president than you are to die on your next flight. <laughs> um, and uh, the amazing thing is that this record has not been matched in other technologies. So this data shows that since the 60s, the rate of fatalities in aviation has plummeted much more rapidly than in automobiles. And why is this? Well, I actually, when I studied this, I concluded that it is, the, it is exactly the fact that people are so aware of the intrinsic hazards of flying that the industry and the regulators and the airlines and the manufacturers of aircraft go to such lengths to make it safe, almost extraordinary lengths. For example, no airplane has yet crashed because of an encounter with a volcanic ash cloud, but there have been some pretty scary close calls. So when the Icelandic volcano erupted in mm -hmm. 2010, nobody took any chances. They shut down the entire North Atlantic for five days. And there were, uh, luckily, I wasn't at somewhere else, but there were a lot of people whose vacations and, and plans were disrupted for a very long time. And the total cost of that was $5 billion in lost economic output. But that, are th that tells you how far we are willing to go to prevent accidents in aviation. And we've learned from that. There's a cool little agency in Nassau that I learned about whose job is basically to collect anonymous reports from pilots and air traffic controllers about the near misses and near disasters that they almost had. And you can actually read about these on the web because they publish them every month in a newsletter called Callback. Now, a bit of advice. If you have fear of flying, and approximately one-third of people have fear of flying, don't read this because <laughs> the stories are pretty hair-raising. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one like a guy said, like, in a congested airspace, the worst thing you can do is turn the wrong way after takeoff. And that's exactly what I did. Why? I just don't know. <laughs> but they collect these reports. And then they publish them to everybody, and everybody in the airline industry reads these, and they get a little bit scared, and they realize this is something I need to be aware of. And the system works because people are not punished for doing this. In fact, they, um, uh, the pilots and controllers call on these anonymous lines, and that after the people at NASA take down all the details, they burn all the identifying information so that there's no possible way this information can be used in a regulatory or a legal proceeding against the people reporting. And it works. People in aviation are incredibly aware of all the dangers around them. And it's not because pilots themselves are intrinsically more careful. For example, people flying, when pi commercial pilots fly their own airplanes, they actually take more chances. There was one accident in the late 1980s. There was a pilot who was, uh, who was flying, I think, for uh, Eastern Airlines. And uh, he had to um, uh, pilot a, a jet from uh, Tampa to New Jersey. And he lived nearby, he lived near Tampa, and he would commute with his own airplane. It was foggy that morning, and he flies in, and he's late, actually. So he attempts a landing in deep fog, and he's, uh, he has to abort and come around again. The, the tower warns him there's deep fog, visibility is down to zero. He tries it anyway. He accidentally lands on a taxiway instead of a runway, and he collides with the 727 that's waiting to take off. He dies in a fiery explosion. A few people on the uh, commercial airline are injured, but otherwise they aren't hurt. So here's the thing is that commercial, the rules that govern how commercial pilots fly would not have allowed him to land that day if he had been flying his commercial jet. But the rules are different for general aviation. My point here is you can create an environment which actually does limit people's ability to take risk. It will cost you, but it does work. Another lesson I learned was the importance of space, is that putting yourself, putting space between you and the source of danger is almost foolproof. Space between the water and our buildings is safer than a levee. Levees tend to collapse or get overtopped. That won't happen if you put a park on the floodplain. Space between homes and forests is safer than fire suppression. If you're up against the forest, uh, then when the fire forest burns, those embers are going to land on your roof and they're going to burn your house down. Space between your house and the forest makes that less likely and also makes it less urgent to suppress the fire. Space is why flying is so safe. They call it the big sky little airplanes. All that space around aircraft. If you're caught in turbulence and the airplane is shaking quite violently, don't worry. You're miles away from the ground. You're not going to crash. But make sure you have your seatbelt your seat on because your head could hit the ceiling and then you'll get a skull fracture. Do your homework. I'm a big believer in research. We can study what things work and what things don't. For example, requiring airplane seats for lap babies, we have discovered, would save very few lives on because there are so few airplane accidents. However, a lot of people could not afford the extra ticket and they would drive and they're more likely to crash and die on the highways. Motorcycle helmet laws save lives and they don't seem to cause offsetting behavior by motorcyclists. Bicycle helmet laws, now keep in mind, bicycle helmets are a very good idea. I always wear a helmet, my kids always wear a helmet, but if you have laws that require people to wear helmets, we now have evidence that the people are less likely to ride their bikes. So they don't get the cardiovascular benefits of riding their bikes. They're more likely to drive cars, which causes congestion. And you have fewer bicycles on the road, and drivers are less aware of their presence. 
And that actually makes the cyclists who do ride, puts them more at, at risk. Um, we should not try to eliminate disaster and crises altogether because sometimes the risks that uh, bring about crises and disasters also have very positive benefits. This is a chart that compares the uh, growth of Thailand and India. Thai India had a very repressed financial system and therefore it has had no financial crises, but it's also had less investment and lower economic growth. Thailand has had a much more open economy and a freewheeling financial system and they had the mother of all financial crises in 1997-98. But as you can see, the financial system allowed a level of investment and risk taking that meant that Thailand still ended up growing faster than India did. So, not, so we should not aim for a zero crisis society because we're going to lose some positive benefits. The same is true of energy. People have an inordinate fear of nuclear meltdowns and accidents um, because it is potentially possible, although highly unlikely, that a nuclear meltdown could kill thousands of people. But if you actually uh, look at the historical record, far more people are dying in accidents related to coal and oil and natural gas. <coughs> Things like the, uh, lack the, 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 air, the train that derailed in Quebec and killed 47 people because of an oil fire. Um, in the case of, uh, a, and this doesn't even include latent deaths due to pollution in the air. So we know that hundreds, in fact, millions of people may die each year because of so soot and particle matter belched into the air by coal, oil, gas, and wood. And nuclear has, doesn't bring any of those risks with it. So, it, it was, uh, so people like the Germans and the Japanese totally overreacted, in my view, to the Fukushima accident because by, sh by taking all their nuclear power offline, they're actually causing more air pollution, which has, worse, uh, which has all sorts of health benefits. My final lesson is that it's okay to have little disasters because that trains us to, re, uh, to, to, to be ready and aware of the, large dis of, of the risks around us and it makes big disasters less likely. Allowing cities to occasionally flood so they can bounce back more quickly. Uh, New York City, for example, is requiring large new buildings to take all their electrical equipment from the basement and move it up to the second floor <coughs> so that the building will not be completely knocked out by the next Hurricane Sandy. Uh, don't get a, uh, an antibiotic every time you or your kid feels sick because that way you're less likely to add to the problem of re resistance and those antibiotics will be available to you and effective when you really need them. And finally, in the financial sector, let's have a system that allows the very biggest banks to fail so that we don't have to bail them out and convince people that the world is a riskless place. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my, those are my final thoughts and David, if we could have a, let's talk about this, I guess. And, uh, yeah, um, great, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that struck me when I was reading the, the whole thing about the ecologists versus the engineers was um, one of the highest concentration of ecologists in the government is in the Forest Service. Yeah, <coughs> right. <coughs> All right. Uh, so I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very high. If, if, if I want to find the engineers at, at the core of engineering, so that you know they're building a levees and, and, and trying to guard the coastal counts. So uh, you know, and when I've talked to people in Forest Service, there's always been this incredible awareness of this policy and the dangers of this policy. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that's now made it very difficult for them to reverse the policy is there's massive intrusions into, into forests by human settlement. That's absolutely right, yes. Right. So it gets back to your, your space issue. So it wasn't a matter of engineering or ecology, it was much more a matter of policies essentially overriding kind of the intellectual, I would say, culture of the agency almost. Well, although I would sort of <coughs> say that you can't actually separate the two, so why are houses being allowed to intrude in the forest. Well, partly it's the belief by the people who own those houses that the Forest Service will come out and put the fires out. So in 2012, um, there were these wildfires in Texas in a town called, I think it's Baltrip. Uh, it's near Austin. Bastrop. Sort of Bastrop. Thank you, thank you, Bastrop. Um, in fact, Rick Perry, who was campaigning for president, actually had to suspend his campaign and go back to deal with the fires. Well, the, the, um, the houses in that subdivision hadn't existed like the last time there were serious fires in that area. And those houses are put there, and they're right next to the woods because it's nice to live next to the woods and because the mm. Texas Forest Service puts fires out. So um, in 19, I write about 1988, the Yellowstone fires, and you talk about, the ro yeah, there are a lot of ecologists in the Forest Service and the Park Service. And so um, they, sus they actually got rid of the 10 a.m. policy in the 60s, and they moved to a policy in both uh, national forests and in the national parks of allowing natural fire, like lightning started fires, to burn where, when it was safe to do so. So that was a policy that was in effect in the spring of, in the summer of 1988 when fires began just outside the boundary of Yellowstone. But what, and I had a very long interview with uh, Bob Barbie who was the superintendent of Yellowstone at the time. And he himself had a part in reintroducing natural fire and prescribed fire into the national parks which had been very successful to that point. So the ecologists on staff 
and he agreed that they should not put these fires out, they should let them burn. But what they didn't anticipate was, first of all, it was a very dry summer, and those fires grew, and they got out of control. They combined into a very large complex. They burned all night instead of going down at nighttime. And so by the middle of July, they said, we've got to put the fires out. But by that time, they were too large to control. And then the politics came in, and like, uh, this is Yellowstone, which is basically a the crown jewel of the park system. And so like phalanxes of, of television journalists and congressmen were landing there, like looking <laughs> at these awful <laughs> pictures of black smoke uh, over the, uh, the park. And, um, and so uh, for Barbie, it was a very tough time. They, they, they basically pulled out the stops and like threw as many firefighters and, and people at this, and they eventually got the fires under control, but it turned out to be one of the worst fires in modern history. Now, what we now know, actually, is that one of the reasons the fires were so bad is that there hadn't been fires, severe fires in Yellowstone for a century, partly because since the f park had been created, the Army and then the Park Service had been suppressing so many fires. Uh, now, the park has actually come back a lot. Uh, you can actually, you can see where the fires were, but the park has come back a lot. But it creates, when you see the kind of like public outrage, it actually creates a very strong, you know, second thought on the part of the people whose job it is to deal with these fires, whether they should suppress or let them burn. I mean, think about the um, risk reward. I could put the fire out and nobody's going to be the wiser for it, you know, that the fact that you know, like 15 or 20 years from now it's going to be a worse fire. Or I could let it burn and something like that could happen, you know, I'll be hauled before Congress or I'll be threatened with the uh, removal of my pension. And one of the, there was a study that was done that after Yellowstone, uh, the, f the, the Forest Service temporarily um, suspended the uh, natural fire policy and began suppressing all fires. And, how, and, and a study found that um, more homes went up next to the forest as a result of that, therefore making it even harder to implement the policy later on. Right. Well, I think you, you can't constantly get this override of the policy and obviously the, the general public perception of should we allow this or shouldn't we? Yeah. Um, we have the same problem with floods, by the way. You know, the National Flood Insurance right. Program, we've tried to uh, raise premiums so that people are actually paying for the risk of living there, and it's, very, it's just very hard politically to actually do that. So if you, if you think this issue of kind of controlling boundaries uh, and the fact that these systems have yeah. uh, very different kinds of fluid boundaries, um, in the financial crisis, let me just ask you, direct, w would you bring back Glass-Steagall? Uh, do you think that, if you, took it, if you go back to the crisis, one of the things that struck me was one of the states that, let's say, made it through somewhat was North Dakota. Which, which was the only state that had a, nas a state bank, which was actually set up in, I think, 19, 1919, and then the Progressive Era. Uh, but they, they actually had a state bank that they separated the commercial from investment. Um, that was an interesting buffer area that was built between those two parts. Obviously, you, s you showed the graph where the bank suffered. Um, do you think that would be useful, actually, to, to reinstate class D? Well, first of all, North Dakota also had a lot of oil, which I'm sure <laughs> uh, was one reason their housing prices didn't fall as much and they didn't have as many defaults, so I'm sure that was relevant. Um, but I actually think that um, bringing back glass steagall in some sense misdiagnoses the problem. Uh, remember, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns were both standalone investment banks. They were not products of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. The issue wasn't that banks could be uh, securities dealers, which is what the repeal of Glass-Steagall allowed. It was the sheer size of both the banks and the so-called shadow banks like Bear Stearns, like Lehman, like Countrywide Financial, like uh, um, um, AmeriQuest, like um, New Century. Uh, and that these shadow banks were growing, had essentially prospered from the fact that so many regulations had been imposed on the regular banks. They could do things that regular banks could not do. We thought that was a good thing because we thought, well, we know from history that it's always the banks that get into trouble, so it's a good thing we're moving the risk somewhere else. But once these shadow banks became as big and even more leveraged than the commercial banks, they became the biggest threat to the economy. And in fact, most of the crisis was about the collapse of shadow banks, not regular banks. So I think the correct lesson from this isn't that, the, that we should keep securities dealers or banks separate. It's that we should, not we should not allow either a securities dealer or a bank to get so large and interconnected that it can bring down the financial system unless it's bailed out, which then just feeds the moral hazard problem. So I believe that we've done a couple things that help a lot. First of all, we require much higher levels of capital from our commercial banks. And in fact, there was a study by the IMF that suggested that at today's capital levels, 85% uh, of previous banking crises would not have happened. The other thing we've done is that in this country where we have so many large financial institutions that are not regulated like banks, is that we said, if you basically act like a bank, we're gonna regulate you like a bank. So GE Capital, a very large financial arm that basically was for all intents and purposes a bank, had to submit to Federal Reserve oversight. And they discovered that it was so onerous that it wasn't worth holding uh, that business any longer, and they've sold it off since then. So I think that 
The other thing that you can do is that there's now a, a mechanism in place in the law that, that forces a large failing institution through a bankruptcy-like procedure. Now, you can protect the most sensitive uh, creditors, like the depositors, some of the bondholders, but the shareholders get wiped out. And the knowledge of that, we hope, we don't know because we haven't tested it yet, the knowledge of that should force people to be more aware of that risk. And, you know, frankly, we'll, we'll need to see it actually used before I think it has the hope for benefits. And let's just hope that it works and we don't have a financial crisis in the process. <laughs> well, I, want, I think one of the, the issues you brought up here, which is, I think it was Freeman Dyson, the physicist, said the, the most dangerous technology is one that's never allowed to fail and then fails. Yes, yes. There's a so line. There's a line from a, a yeah, um, a, from that I quote from a French uh, expert who says, "An incident-free system becomes mute." Right. So I think the the issue is going to how do you uh, uh, certainly you know if you look at the airlines, they went through a lot of failure technically to get a, a, a good safe commercial plane up. Yeah. Um, Pilots spend enormous numbers of hours in, in flight simulators wh yeah. where they get to fail. I mean, how do you create a system that allows whatever it is, banks, ecologists, whatever, to actually fail, fail softly and fail in a way that's not embarrassing? Because I think that's the other piece is there's this, this kind of overlay of it, political embarrassment. If it's that's a tough one. I mean, the litigiousness and the, the natural sense that, first of all, it, owning up to your mistakes is not a human. As human beings, we don't tend to, like, instinctively do that. Uh, and plus, uh, we have essentially a risk-reward system that punishes people who, who make mistakes. So I think the, avia the Aviation Safety Reporting System, which is this agency of, mm -hmm. agency of NASA, NASA, is an interesting template. And I'll tell you, for example, a big problem in healthcare is medical errors. And so a number of people have tried to introduce similar incident reporting, anonymous incident reporting systems in medical contexts. And they've had a lot of trouble doing it, and there are a couple of reasons why. First of all, there are so many types of medical errors and second, and, there's, and there's so many of them happen. Second of all, doctors and hospital people actually know what causes medical errors, but they seldom rise to the level of, of, of gravity that is worth the effort to actually root them all out. For example, when they tried to create data collection systems to record medical errors, there were just too many different types of errors to record, and it was just a lot of hassle. And finally, there's this whole litigious thing, thing is that um, there isn't a legal context in the hospital setting that can protect people who admit to medical errors from being sued or fired for it. So getting around that problem is an issue. I learned um, uh, in the railroad system, for example, um, uh, y you could argue that they could, they could use something like this to deal with problems like the Amtrak derailment. And, and, and uh, th that ought to be an environment that lends itself to this type of um, incident reporting system. Yeah, that's an interesting model. I don't know how, as you say, transferable it is. Uh, I think part of it was also taking it outside of the, essentially, the federal aviation. Uh, yes, and putting yes. it in NASA. As no, you're absolutely right. In fact, when they were setting it up, it, you know, when the industry and the FAA got together to talk about it, um, they concluded it could not be part of their regulator because it would discourage people from stepping forward. So the. Um, uh, so the ASRS only has the power to like report incidents and advise people. It's basically like the uh, Paul Revere out there basically banging the bell and warning people, but it doesn't have the power to actually force anyone to take any action. And that ironically is part of its, uh, the beauty of it, which is that they f people feel more free uh, talking to them because they don't feel that there are enormous um, uh, legalistic consequences to doing so. So let's... Uh Let's take some questions. Um, just raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone because we're videotaping this and just let us know uh, who you are and, and where you're from. Uh, all the way in the back. Uh, yeah. uh, Fred Smith, Competitive Enterprise Institute. I recall Wadowski's great statement, the greatest risk is the attempt to avoid all risk. Um, but I wonder one point you touched upon, but I don't think you systematized it quite well. Over the last century, century and a half, there's been a massive shift of the risk management function from the private sector, where localized knowledge and you pay for your own mistakes, to the political function, flood insurance, Federal Reserve. You mentioned a whole series of those things. To what extent is that possibly a major factor? Do, I don't know the trends for these various safety trends. They were getting better throughout history. But were they getting better before we politicized the risk management function? Because it seems now the major is political response to any disaster is to expand the government or the socialization of risk, which seems to me one of the most dangerous things we can do. Um, well, this is a complicated question because um, uh, you're absolutely right, is that as a society we have 
given the, the, the government more and more responsibility for the containment of risk. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is actually a very interesting philosophical question because um, if you sort of take the attitude, well, you know, uh, the freedom from fear uh, uh, line by Fr uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, which where he basically said it's part of the job of the government to save people from the, uh, f from the um, horrors of destitution or disaster. And when he signed Social Security into law, he said we can't eliminate all risks to you, but we can actually, you know, at least take the worst risks away. That seems to be a choice that we have made as a society, and it's a choice that most societies have made. It seems to be that, you know, in economics we talk about like uh, income, e um, uh, 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 goods that we buy when we become wealthier, and safety and security is one of them. We give up some things like uh, freedom, and we pay more higher insurance premiums, and we accept a bit of moral hazard because we think that's the price for staying safer. There's also an argument to be made that a lot of this would have happened even in the absence of the government. For example, um, Sam Peltzman's original research on seat, belt re on seat belts did find that after the introduction of federal motor vehicle safety standards in the 60s, you did find a steady decline in fatalities. But what Peltzman noted was that that decline had also been in place in 30 years before the laws came along. So it is probably the case that while federal motor vehicle standards did contribute somewhat to that decline in fatalities, most of it would have happened anyway because people naturally wanted more safety as they became more affluent. Remember, seat belts were introduced as an, uh, ri originally at the industry's own initiative. They, didn't, they were not uh, compelled. The same with anti-lock brakes, the same with electronic stability control. A lot of the devices that mm -hmm. keep us safe in cars today were not forced on car makers, but were actually in early introduced early on as options. Not all of them worked, but a lot of them did. The other thing that happened is there's been a greater awareness of catastrophic risk. I mean, I mean tail risk. So 9-11, um, essentially, until 9-11, a terrorism risk was essentially a rider on most property and casualty insurance uh, policies. And the insurance companies basically didn't charge for it because they had no experience with it and didn't think it was worth having to charge for it. So 9-11 comes along and caused tens of billions of dollars in insured losses and, of course, tragic loss of life and all sorts of other, um, you know, uh, deep traumatic uh, uh, consequences for us as a society. Um, Warren Buffett's company, General Re, sustained a lot of losses. And later on, Warren Buffett, reflecting on this, said General Re made one of the cardinal errors, in my view, which is that they based their willingness to sell insurance on experience rather than exposure. And he said, there are some risks we now know that no insurance company could possibly survive, and only the federal government can assume those risks. And if the federal government doesn't assume those risks, then, the very, then some commerce will grind to a halt because the insurance isn't available. So we now see the federal government as insurer of last resort and terrorism risk. Uh, in many states, uh, in California, the state is insurer of last resor resort and earthquake risk. And in Florida, they're the insurer of last resort in uh, hurricane risk. Now, I don't have a fundamental mm -hmm. problem with that rule because some of those risks are uninsurable. And in fact, the private sector overcharges for them because they're afraid of being rendered insolvent. What I think we need to do is get away from insurance that is sold at an actuarially um, uh, excessively low rate, so basically subsidizes risky activity. So Floridians pay too little for their hurricane insurance, and we charge too little for national flood insurance policies. So not only do we, um, so not only do we have this inherent risk that people will always live on floodplains because it's um, prosperous to do so, but we're basically subsidizing them to do so. So I think um, if we as a society have decided that the federal government is the only actor that can assume some of these risks, then we actually have to at least at a minimum do our best to make sure that they are properly paid for taking those risks. Unless there's an explicitly stated social policy goal why the federal government or the taxpayer is going to pay for some of that insurance. And uh, like, for example, we have in the case of Social Security. Yep, right there. Yeah, Lars Hansen uh, with uh, Levine Hansen Associates. The, a couple things. One is, I I throughout this, what I'm hearing is human psychology more than anything else. The anonymous reporting really began with the military with what are called on any mouse reports, where people can so, you know, report anonymously and where therefore not any problems in doing so. The Air France 447 problem arose because two out of the three uh, airspeed indicators, both of them made by fails, and known to have a freezing problem, and they were supposed to be uh, replaced according to a French airworthiness directive. When that happened, the autopilot dumped off, and the, uh, the 
co-pilot, the pilot wasn't in the cockpit apparently, co-pilot um, should have realized that he is now flying the plane and did not. And so we have a psychological problem in which the reliance on some safety mechanism, such as insurance of last resort, makes people either neglect the fact that they're now at risk or fail to take action. So the one thing that interests me in all of this is how do you address the psychological problems which, which run across the whole gamut of what you've been talking about in order to get people to recognize risk and then act to reduce it? So the first thing is that we may never be able to get rid of all of them. And by the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing because one of the reasons we try to make people safer is because is to make them feel better. Because frankly, it is not a pleasant feeling to feel like you're about to die every minute of the day. <laughs> and uh, there was an interesting study done in Israel. Uh, they went out and they asked people, um, uh, are you afraid of a conventional, uh, an, uncon an attack by Iran with unconventional weapons? And uh, they found that a lot of people were afraid and that they felt quite bad about it. Then they asked a different group of people, do you own a gas mask? And they said, well, yes, of course we own a gas mask because in Israel everybody has one. They're handed out for free by the government. Then they asked those people the same question and they expressed a lot less anxiety about the possibility of an attack by Iran with unconventional weapons. So the knowledge that there is something there to keep you safe actually makes you feel better. And that's not a small thing. In the Oregon medical experiment where Oregon extended health insurance to a lot of people who are too poor to afford insurance but not qualify for Medicaid, they discovered to their dismay that people were not healthier as a result and they spent a lot more money. But they found one important difference, a lot lower incidence of depression. And what we speculate happens is that knowing you have health insurance means you're less worried about a catastrophic illness ruining your life. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. I'm not sure we should actually make people be afraid all the time. Do you know the, for you know the famous, li famous line by Gordon Tullock? That we can make people drive very safely if we just attach a uh, sharp knife blade sticking out from the steering wheel at them all the time. <laughs> so that's really not a very fun way <coughs> to drive your car. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is I think there is a way to institutionalize the uh, aviation thing of being a little bit scared, of being always aware of your surroundings. So um, uh, after the Air F France accident, the uh, Air Flight 447 accident, there's much more emphasis on exactly this excessive trust in technology. There's an, there's an awareness that pilots almost never fly the plane themselves in difficult conditions. And when something like the conditions you described happens, they don't know what to do or they respond the same way. So part of pilot training has become upset and prevention training. You know, actually uh, putting them in simulators and trying to like simulate uh, not having the devices they're supposed to have. Um, so I think that's part of it. I, uh, I was on vacation, I was actually on my honeymoon in France, this was in, uh, about 20 years ago, and I was driving along the freeway and I remember a sign that I guess the uh, French highway department put up there and it said, la vitesse aircraft too. And I've asked my French friends, what does this mean? And they said, it means speed makes everything worse. And I said, well, you know, darn it, that's right. You know, if you are driving 60, 70 miles per hour, <laughs> then we know from physics that the force of the collision will be exponentially higher than if you crash at 60 miles per hour. And by the way, if you try to keep maintain space around yourself, that space means less when you're traveling at 70 than when you're traveling at 60 or 55. So that little reminder comes into my head all the time when I notice that I'm going about the speed limit. And so like just you know, reminding your kids, always be aware of cars around you when you're crossing the street. So th I call this like being a little bit scared, not being spastically scared, but being intelligently scared and, and a, a reminding yourself these little things that you can do little basic things that are remarkably effective at removing some of the most serious risks from our lives. And some of this has to do, you, you talk a lot about spatial space, but some of it has to do with temporal space, right? And, and those, we're offloading more and more decisions onto very high-speed computer algorithms. Well, that's a good point. Right, so some of it, it could be high-speed trading, yeah. um, what, you, what you saw in the Air France flight, uh, what you might see in autonomous vehicles. So you have this, I think, in incredible compression of time that goes way beyond our, s our reaction times. That's an interesting point. I actually did not study that particular aspect of space, but it's an intriguing one. But a related idea is interconnectedness, the systems that are extremely complex is that, uh, you know, a failure, for example, um, somebody mentioned what, Wadowski, is that how you, um, I think you, sir, mentioned the Anton Wadowski uh, book. The Chernobyl accident was actually while they were trying to test one of its actually safety systems. Uh, and so complex systems are so um, interconnected that uh, often small things cause a, a series of failures. And so one of the things safety experts have tried to do is reduce interconnectedness so you don't get that domino effect. And in the case of the financial system, one thing they've tried to do is impose, when, the, when they investigated some of these complex financial institution, institutions, they would find they have like 6,000 legal subsidiaries. Mm 
right? In that their Cayman Island subsidiary was the one that was actually entering into these derivatives contracts with somebody else's Cayman Island subsidiary, and nobody really knew who's going to be like responsible if like one of those contracts went bad. So they're imposing uh, the so-called living will requirement on large banks, so they actually have to explain how they would be taken through bankruptcy and how all these subsidiaries would be shrunk. And uh, interestingly enough, bankers are discovering that <laughs> a lot of these subsidiaries are in fact unnecessary and they themselves are pursuing a simpler structure. And hopefully that will reduce some of these chain reaction type failures that uh, we've just talked about. Let's do one, one more question. Okay. Back. Okay. Uh, a fascinating talk, and of course, part of a large literature that I'm sure you know very, very well in this area. The surprising thing to me is, you know, FTA, FDR, when, F, uh, when federal deposit insurance was introduced, was querulous. He said this will make banks act irresponsibly, but we never seem to revisit those disconnection of the risk system. We we not don't disconnect it. We discon we expanded it from 2000 to essentially an infinite amount of deposit insurance today, and we added on all the insurance for federal, uh, for Fannie and Freddie, and then all the other things. Effectively, we promoted the moral hazard problem that the insurance system was supposed to resolve. Wouldn't it be, it's sort of surprising we've never revisited any of those things. We tried with flood insurance, we tried a little bit with fire stuff, but in both cases, it was rolled back because nobody could articulate the safety reasons and the rational reasons for reforming those systems. Do you see any hope in reform? We've talked about the psychological factor, the political factor. Well, first of all, I would actually um, provide a slightly different interpretation of what's happened since the 1930s. And you're absolutely right. FDR was very worried about the moral hazard consequences of deposit insurance, but there was a very strong um, um, upsurge of feeling in Congress that this had to be done. And so it, it, it happened anyway. But there, because of the recognition of moral hazard, with deposit insurance came a much more vigorous system of federal oversight of these banks. Now, y we can argue about whether that was a good thing because it meant banks couldn't do certain things. And for example, it, it actually deprived a lot of people of credit because um, regulated banks couldn't make certain loans that were deemed too risky. But what happened, interesting along the way, is that because people wanted types of loans and the banks weren't providing it, is that this wonderful innovative society we have created alternatives. And that is how the, what we now call the shadow banks came about. Uh, in the early 1980s, um, in the 1990s, as I was talking about, as these restrictions tightened on the, um, on the banks, we saw the um, creation of a lot of financial company lenders like Household Finance, like Countrywide. And what their model was that they would originate the mortgage but because they did not have the deposit base to fund that mortgage permanently, they would put them into a mortgage-backed security and sell that to private investors. And everybody said, this is great. This is really good. This is not only protecting banks because they're not the ones making the mortgages. It's actually diffusing risk throughout the financial system. Instead of like one bank in North Dakota or Massachusetts or Texas being um, exposed to only mortgages in Massachusetts or Texas, an investor a Chinese investor can buy a mortgage-backed security and have exposure to mortgages from all around the country. So in this perverse way, these efforts to make the banking system safer caused the risk to migrate outwards. And because people falsely believed that, well, actually, they, it was true for a while that that made the system safer, but it actually un, you know, unleashed uh, an enormous supply of credit, some of it channeled through Fannie and Freddie, that enabled a housing bubble to happen that might not have happened in a system that had not allowed the risk to migrate out of the banking system. So that, that would be my first point, is that I, I interpret things a little bit differently. But where I completely agree with you is that the rescues and the bailouts of 2008 and 2009 have, have actually created a new aura of too big to fail around big institutions. And you could see this in the pricing of their debt. They could systematically borrow at lower prices than smaller institutions that everybody knew could be allowed to fail. So one of the priorities in this period is to squeeze out that too big to fail premium. And one of the ways to do it, as I was talking about, was to force them to hold more capital so they're less likely to fail. That makes them less profitable, and shareholders will therefore discourage banks from getting big and being subject to those rules. But the other thing is to make it as clear as possible that they can be allowed to fail. And as I said, I don't think we'll be able to prove we've succeeded until something actually happens. <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to be around when it happens. I mean, nobody really knows what will happen. But if you actually watch the pricing of their bonds, 
they are cr uh, slowly converging on the price that um, the higher uh, borrowing rates that smaller banks have to fail. The rating agencies have started to take away the benefit of too big to fail from the ratings that they sign to these banks. We haven't succeeded yet, but I do believe we're going in the right direction. Greg, thank you for coming back. Well, and thank you, David. Us. It's been great. Thanks for having me, yeah. and thanks for having me last uh, last year. I really enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, there's there's some books out there if you want to buy them. Perfect. You, yeah, uh, absolutely. You hang around for a few minutes sure. if you want to talk. Thanks a lot.